Okay, good morning everybody. Looks like we're live on Facebook. Looks like we're live right here on Zoom. So, it's all good. Welcome in everybody. Uh, we got everybody muted. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, standard rules apply. You can unmute the mics if you need to say something. Chat is open. Welcome in. Let me just go over to Facebook on the tablet so I can monitor over here. And we'll have sort of all of our ducks in a row. And we'll get into it. All right. We've got Facebook up on the and on the tablet. We've got Zoom going. Good morning, everybody. Welcome in. Everybody, thank you so much for being here bright and early on a Monday morning. It's the 9 o'clock program. I'm Ivan. I'm back. Yes. You know, we had a little trouble last week. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, I've been doing live educational presentation in the haircut industry for many, many years. And it's been a lot of years since I had a voice problem. Um, typically, in trade shows and convention centers, especially three-day shows, and especially in places like Chicago where the air in the convention center is very dry. Chicago's show was always early March, end of February. And the air is dry in the building and too much talking, too loud, for too long, in bad air. And by day three, Ivan can't talk anymore. It's been a while since I've had that problem. I've learned to manage it a little bit. But um, lately, two a days, plus a lot of times there's an evening class that I do as well. Um, just added up to a little bit of real roughness in the voice, but I can't tell you how, how nice it was to hear from so many of you. I got so many um, private messages and direct messages and email messages from people wishing me well, hoping I was feeling better and looking forward to me being back this week. So uh, the time off did me some good. I, I did my best to do as little talking as possible, which for me is a bit of a challenge uh, because you know me, I'm going. Um, but it was a good quiet weekend. This week, two a day, nine and 11, every day. Um, I've got one program in the evening. I'm gonna try to kind of minimize that a little bit and, and get back into it slowly. And as you can tell, I'm speaking a little softer at this point. Um, I spent a lot of time yelling. It's just, I'm, I'm excited, I'm enthusiastic. I'm so geeked up for the things we share and the things we do uh, in the business that sometimes that's got me hopping up and down and hollering. So. That's the story on the voice, but I'm back, and I'm good as ever, and I'm going to try to just ease into things a little bit. I've got so much going on. It's such an exciting time. We've got a full schedule for the week. I'm going to go over um, classes and topics. Uh, we're going to tweak a little bit during the week. Uh, we'll get everything in, but we may shuffle what we do and when we do it. Um, this morning, nine o'clock, is scissor cutting basics. It was originally billed as razor cutting. Razor cutting has to be done later in the week, and there's a couple of reasons why I needed to manipulate that. But it's kind of an interesting day today because it's a basics day. We're gonna talk about razor, uh, scissor cutting basics, and then we're gonna talk about running on time. And running on time, I think, is so important for two reasons. It's the old school reason of just anything else is not acceptable. We run on time, that's it. And we're gonna talk about really putting a line in the sand, drawing a hard line, and never, ever, 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 ever running late. We're gonna talk about that. It's even more important right now for our industry, I think, as most states are suggesting and recommending that we not be serving clients right now on a walk-in basis. So what that means is all of a sudden, everybody who's traditionally been, hey buddy, nice to see you, have a seat, I'll be with you in a minute, can't play that way. It's gotta be walk-ins. Not only, not, it's gotta be appointments, but not only appointments, but you can't just sit down in the waiting room and wait your turn. You gotta wait in your car, you gotta text us to let us know you're here. We'll text you to let you know to come in when the last client is gone after we've had an opportunity to sanitize our workstation. This is a weird world, but it's gonna be so, so very important that we run on time. Not close, not late, but absolutely freaking on time. So that's 11 o'clock. We're gonna cover the running on time class at 11 o'clock this morning. Um, tomorrow, 
Uh, hopefully we'll have the razor cutting class tomorrow at 11 o'clock, held over from last week when it was moved because of my voice, is membership programs. Again, um, always an interesting topic, how to structure, run, and execute haircut membership programs. Can be a huge business builder for people. I'm looking forward to talking about that. Uh, Wednesday, we have 9 o'clock in the morning, Clipper Clinic. We're going to go back to digging into my Clipper Museum, my Clipper Archives. We're going to go back to Clipper Clinic. 11 o'clock is a program on how to structure and execute charity events and publicity stunts for your haircutting businesses. I think that's going to be an interesting one. How to run charity events. I've done a lot of this over the years. Charity events, just like the membership programs, can be a huge business building category. Totally new class. Um, on Thursday, scissor over comb. Back to scissor cutting, but scissor over comb cutting. Deep dive, classic skill, very important. And we're going to do a program at 11 o'clock um, from the 100 by 100 business building book. It's a program called The 400, and it's really about the number of, you need 400 clients to be busy. We're gonna talk specifically about who is that 400? How do you target that 400? How do you build that 400? Who are your 400 customers? Because we all need 400 customers. And when we think about the business in that way, it's a very small business. It doesn't take much to be busy. But 400 customers will make you a $100,000 hair cutter. So we're gonna dig into that. Um, Nine o'clock on Friday, is razor line and edge. We've been there before. It's something we gotta keep talking about because there's so much interest in. And I'll have a special guest at 11 o'clock on Friday. We're doing a program on Friday on how to open a barbershop or hair salon. How to open a barbershop or hair salon. And my special guest is a friend of mine who just last year, before the coronavirus thing exploded on us, just last year opened up his own barbershop and he's going to share with us some of his stories and experiences. He's going to share the top three things he did right in opening his barbershop and the top three things that turned out to be, let's just call them learning experiences in opening his barbershop. So Scott's going to be a guest in the 11 o'clock program on uh, Friday this week. So that's a full week of schedule with a lot going on. Had a big exciting thing happen over the weekend that I want to share with you guys. Some of you saw it on social media and some of you reacted to it immediately. The rest of you are welcome to react to it today if you wish. And that is Mr. Mailman brought me, check it out, Mr. Mailman brought me the new books. The new books. This is Big Busy Barber Shop and Bigger Busy Barber Shop. These are books one and books two. Now you'll remember last week or the week before, we closed out the old titles. We closed out the old covers. Well, these are the brand new versions of Bigger and Big, Big and Bigger. Big Busy Barber Shop, Bigger Busy Barber Shop. These are my 52 week roadmap books to growing business. The white one is year one, the gray one is year two. We've got nice sharp covers. They look like they're part of the family with 100 by 100 and $100,000 hair cutter. A big shout out to my graphic artist who took care of the covers on the books. They are available paper or digital. They are also available in a combo pack where you save a little bit of money when you buy the pair together. But these are marketing. These are hyper-focused on whether you're a shop owner or an individual behind a chair building and growing your business. It's one idea a week, every single week, 52 weeks. Book one is weeks one through 52. Book two is 53 through 104. So you've got two years of solid marketing strategy to build and grow a barbershop. The stuff in here is exactly how I built my business. And my business did 330 to 350 haircuts every single day. That's exactly how we did it. So the books are in, the books are here, the books are ready. The new covers, we're very excited. Let's go to $100,000 hair cutter. Let's start the day. Let's get into our program. Drinking is important, gotta stay lubricated. April 11, uh, May 11. May 11. Day 131 with 234 days remaining in the year. May 11, thank your mom. Thank your mom. Thank someone else's mom. Thank someone who's like a mom to you. Everyone has or had a mom. You literally would not be here without mom. She had a hand in making you who you are. 
thank mom for making you who you are today and who you will be down the road. You don't get to pick your mom, but you do get to choose how you treat mom. Treat mom well. Well, we had Mother's Day over the weekend. Anybody out here who's listening who's a mom, thank you for being a mom. Thank you for all you have done. Anybody out here that wants to be a mom, hopefully you had a good mom who was a good example of what you're going to do to be a mom. Anybody here who doesn't have a mom, reach out to somebody else's mom. Uh, my mom's been gone for a while, but uh, my mo mother-in-law is a mom to me, um, and there's plenty others in my life uh, who've had an influence on uh, where we are today and how we got there. So uh, I have it at that point in the book because it, it's Mother's Day right around this time of year, and it literally was yesterday, guys. So uh, that's the tip for the day. Who's got a date for one more? Somebody in uh, Jenna. Jenna says September 22. Let's take a look at September 22. I think we've done September 22. Yeah, we have talked about it. It's certainly, it's been a class here in our program. September 22, day 265 of the year, with 100 days remaining in the year. Taper with the skip guard system. Hey, throw me a thumb if you remember skip guard. Throw me a thumb if you've been here before to participate in skip guard tapering or to see what that is all about. Uh, plenty of you have seen that. But skip guard tapering is a system where we use a series of snap-on attachment guides or guards to create a true classic taper through the perimeter of a haircut. It's the same principles we use when we uh, use detachable blades, interchangeable detachable blades on a haircut, um, but the skip guard system is some of what that is all about. So while uh, today, May 11, thanking your mom, we'll call that a personal tip, uh, September 22, taper with skip guard is absolutely a technical cutting tip. So you know the book. Uh, one idea a day, every day, 365 days to help you build and grow your business. Amazon or Ivanzoot.com, paper, digital, or audio. If you don't have a book yet, you better go get a book. Coincidence, May 11's $100,000 haircut tip. I was born on Mother's Day. Mother's Day moves around. You're not born on Mother's Day every year, but there you go. What a coincidence. Yes. Is today your birthday, Scott? May 11, is May 11 your birthday? I didn't see that notification come up on Facebook. Well, there it is, I was born on Mother's Day. Okay, maybe you were born a different day when Mother's Day fell on a different day. Today is Scott's birthday, so happy birthday to Scott. Scott right here is the guy that I mentioned earlier is gonna be the guest for us on Friday on our program of opening a barbershop or hair salon, opening a business. So I'm sure Scott's got uh, great information planned for that one. So uh, let's get into it. I wanna talk about scissor cutting basics. And I don't wanna scare off any experienced hair cutters when I mention that the program is basics. Um, you know, it's a funny story I always tell when I started teaching clipper cutting. I started teaching a very basic clipper cutting class. And I was teaching basic clipper cutting class for some dealers and distributors in the Chicagoland area. And I had a meeting with the man who owned the distributor that I was working for. And I was, as Ivan as always, I was very excited about, hey, let's get some classes going. And I did a basic clipper class in his six different store locations. Well, when the sixth one was over, I went to get paid and I went to go say thank you to him. And I said, what are we gonna do next? We gotta do an advanced clipper cutting class. And I learned a powerful lesson from him. He said, Ivan, he says, keep doing what you do. Don't do a different class. We're gonna book you in, we're gonna do the same class that you already did. We're gonna do that class again. And we're gonna do it again. And we're gonna do it again. And his point was that number one, the audience changes every time you do another class. Number two, not everybody grasps everything from the class when you share it. So everybody will still get something new out of that class. Number three, his point was, the more you teach that same class, you'll get better and better at teaching that class because you'll refine and you'll hone and you'll polish your skills and abilities and that one class will just keep getting better. He said, and number two is, from his experience, and this is what he shared, he said, if we book you for a basic clipper class, no one will show up, no one will sign up, no one will take the class because nobody wants to admit that they're basic. He said, if we book you for an advanced class, everybody will show up for the class and you'll be teaching basic because no one will really be advanced in that environment or that situation. He said, so we're just gonna call it clipper cutting and you'll teach to the room. If you get to a point where 
their skills and abilities have advanced and you can raise the bar a little bit, you will. But if you get to a point where you can continue to share basic in that way, you can do that. And you know, he was very right. And, and here we are, you know, 30 years later, I'm still teaching and sharing. And a lot of what I teach is still very basic in its presentation, in its structure, in its outlay. And he was absolutely right. There's always new people in the room. He was absolutely right. People think they're more advanced than they are. We tend to overestimate where our abilities and our skill sets are. Uh, it's part of the nature of the way we're built in this industry. So don't let the term basic scare you um, because I'm sure there's something for everybody in this class as it relates to the world of uh, scissor cutting. So I want to start out with some fundamentals. I want to grab a scissors. This is my Cosmo Barbarology scissors. That is a uh, six and a half. It's six and a half inches. Remember, scissors are measured from the back of the upper finger ring to the tip of the blade. So if we get a tape measure out, that's six and a half. We don't include the tang or the finger rest. Now this one features an adjustable pivot mechanism. That is a knob that can be turned to control the tension. Now Denise talked about this in our scissor class last week, but when scissors are properly lubricated, and I'm gonna put a little bit of oil. If you saw me, I put a little drop of oil on either side of the pivot screw. I'm gonna walk the pivot screw a few times back and forth like that to move the oil between the screw. And then I'm gonna pick up a clean soft cloth and I'm gonna wipe up any excess oil anywhere around the blade area. Properly adjusted scissor tension. When you hold a scissor up at a T at 90 degrees and you let go of it, it should fall but it shouldn't close all the way. So that scissors right there is too loose. I'm gonna tighten it one click. Now some scissors, their adjustment screw clicks. Others, it's a soft friction. Now I'm gonna drop it again and it should fall about halfway. That's pretty good right there. That's proper tension. If your scissor is too loose, if it slams all the way shut, it's gonna fold or bend the hair. If your scissor is too tight, it's gonna to require too much force on your part, too much pressure on your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder, and your arm, and it's gonna dull or wear the blades because you've got the blades literally grinding against one another. So that's adjusting your scissor tension. Make sure the scissor is cleaned and oiled when you do make that tension adjustment. Now, as far as scissor care is concerned, every scissor, every haircut, every client, every time, we're gonna spray with clipper side. Big shout out to our friends at Barbicide. That's enough. You don't need the scissor to be dripping wet. You need it to be wet. You need the surface to be fully coated with the product to do its job. And if you read the back of the can, it will tell you on the back of the can, where does it say it on the back of the can? I know it's here because I've read it a thousand times. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, it's a 10 minute can. That means it's gotta be wet, the surface must be wet for 10 minutes. Now you're ready and you're good to go. That's basic scissor care. Wipe your scissors clean, sanitize them, disinfect them after every client, put them back in the case. A scissor on a towel on the top of a station winds up on the floor when somebody grabs your uh, clipper side is not, it's a cleaner. Um, Nicholas, your question. Disinfect, lubricate, cleans, cools, anti-rust. It's got those five functions on it right there. Yeah, and the nice thing is under pressure, it'll also blow a little bit of hair out from between the pivot mechanism. If you use a cleaning brush, the brush itself isn't clean, but it's good for getting the hair and the clippings away from the pivot mechanism, and then you're gonna oil and then you're gonna sanitize. So it's every scissor, every client, every service, every time. Let's take a look at scissor parts. You've got finger rings. You've got the upper and the lower finger ring. The upper finger ring is intended for your ring finger. Your pinky sits on the finger rest with your two fingers sitting out on the frame, just like that. The lower ring is the thumb ring. Your thumb goes in there, but not much of your thumb. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Your thumb goes in there, but not your whole thumb, only a little bit of your thumb. The pivot mechanism or the pivot screw is where the two pieces or the two halves of the scissor are held together. And we talked about a tension adjustment screw. Some scissors require an actual bladed screwdriver to get in there to be able to adjust that tension screw. And I actually have a special scissor screwdriver upstairs in my toolbox. I'll bring that down and I'll show that to you during the uh, scissor over comb class next week. And then you've got your blades. You've got your still blade and you've got your moving blade. Your moving blade is attached to your thumb. 
your still blade is attached to your finger rings and you'll notice the moving blade is called the moving blade because the moving blade is moving. The still blade is called the still blade because the still blade is still not moving. It is not moving. It is stable. It is rock steady. It is solid. There's a discipline here that you want to maintain. The discipline is you can you dip scissors in barbicide? You can put scissors in barbicide. Scissors are metal. Scissors can be absolutely disinfected in barbicide. Um, you want to avoid clanking around in the jar, and this was an important point that Denise made in the class the other day. If you do put scissors in the barbicide jar, put them in tips up not tips down. You don't want them opening in the jar. You don't want anything getting between the blades. Put them in tips up when you put them in a barbicide jar. Um, yes, barbicide will do a great job. However, I'm not crazy about them being in the barbicide jar when there's other things in the jar. If I put my scissors in, I might put them in alone. They only need to be in there for 10 minutes. Put them in for 10, take them out, rinse them off, dry them off and put them away, that's perfectly fine. But I don't like multiple scissors in the barbicide jar, and I don't like scissors in there with combs and clips and clipper guards and other things. Just because if the blades are open, I want to be very carefully protective of those internal blade edges. Whether you have a Japanese hollow ground design, or whether you have a bevel scissor, or whether you have a serrated edge scissor. And we'll talk about some of those differences along the way. Um, but that's your basic scissor parts. Finger rings, finger rest, handles, pivot mechanism, upper and lower blade, moving blade, non-moving blade. Let's talk about that discipline. You know, back when I was in cosmetology school, and again in barber school, they emphasized this moving blade, non-moving blade idea. And one of the things they encouraged us to do, and I'm not encouraging you to do this, was to practice in the car. If you were driving to beauty school, one hand on the wheel, one hand on your scissors, doing this. We would sit in our chairs and we would do this. We would rest the non-moving blade on the back of our hand, and this is to keep the upper portion of our hand quiet, not a lot of movement there, and have that thumb, the lower portion, the thumb moving like this. This is stability, and this comes down to following guidelines. This comes down to keeping haircuts nice and clean and precise. I do want to stop a minute, I want to talk about finger fitting. And when we talk about finger fitting, I think one of the great people we can talk about is our friends at Shark Fin. This is a Shark Fin scissors. And Shark Fin's thing has always been about ergonomics and fit. They have a patent on the design of the fin right there that is designed to position your upper hand quietly at the top of the scissors. This is a Shark Fin titanium. The titanium scissors feature a bevel edge. Um, they're a little crispier in their cutting action, but uh, one of Shark Fin's things is their finger ring patent. And literally, you get all kinds of rings with your scissors. And the rings, the patent with their rings is the stacking of the rings. I want to show you here in the upper hole, I have two rings in there. I have the large ring and the little ring that goes inside the large ring in the hole. That's a pretty big hole. Shark fins have pretty big holes because they let you finger fit. The rule is that upper ring should stop in the middle of your first and second knuckle. Right there, if everybody can see that. It should go to there. I can get all the way into the base. That's too big. And if I'm out here at the tip, I have a lot of room or play. So what shark fin will do when you buy a scissors at a show is they'll help you fit that. They'll put that finger ring in there, and they'll tighten it up. Now, with those double rings in there, when I put that in, look where that stops. That stops right at the middle of my finger, between my first and second knuckle. That is properly fitted for my finger. Now, I don't have big, fat fingers, and that fits in there real nice. Now, the, the bottom ring, this is important, too, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to stick your thumb all the way in the ring. Look at that. I got my thumb all the way in the ring. Number one, I actually have to use my other hand to get it out. And if I'm properly cutting hair, I'm going to comb hair, I'm going to hold hair, I'm going to cut hair, then I'm going to take my thumb out and palm my scissors. That's called palming my scissors. I got my scissors closed up in my hand. Then I'm going to transfer my comb back to this hand while my hand is holding my scissors closed. This is for safety. This is when I'm combing. 
If I keep my thumb in there and my scissors cocked open like that, when I go to comb the hair, I am waving around an open scissor with very sharp blades. I want my thumb out, I want my hand closed, I want my scissor palmed so that I can effectively and safely comb hair. So I've got to be able to get my thumb in and get my thumb out and get my thumb in and get my thumb out. But when I say get my thumb in, I want to show you how much of my thumb I want to get in. I'm going to grab a Sharpie marker and I'm going to put a line on my thumbnail with a Sharpie marker. Can you see that line on my thumbnail? That line on my thumbnail shows you how much thumb I want in my scissors. I'm going to do this. I hope the camera can pick this up. See what I just did? I put that much of my thumb in the scissors. All the rest of my thumb is out. One of the things I do is I take the edge of my thumbnail, the tip of my thumbnail, and I push it against the side of the ring like that. Now, with a big old ring that I can get my whole thumb in, that can be a problem. So what you do is you use finger rings. Now, shark fins rings are different sizes, and shark fins rings also have a difference in their texture. This black one is very rigid, hard plastic. This blue one is kind of soft and squishy. You can see the difference. And this red one is very, very soft and squishy. So the difference is in the materials. This one is a plastic, this one is a softer rubber, and this one is actually like a silicone, very squishy. So when I put these rings in the scissors, and I'm gonna put the black ring in the scissors, the hard plastic ring in the scissors, and I have to force it in there just a little bit. Then I'm gonna take the, oh no, that's not the one that was in here. These three are the same size. I have the blue one and the purple one. The blue one is harder plastic, and the purple one is the squishy silicone. So the blue one, it's hard to see because it's a blue scissors, but I put the blue one in there, and that'll keep, I can't get my whole thumb in there anymore. Look at that, it won't get past the knuckle. But I still have too much thumb in there to be effectively cutting. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the little ring inside the big ring, and now all I can get, look at that, it lines up perfectly. See the line on my thumb? Boom. That's all I want in there. That gives me total control, but I'm very quickly in and out and in and out and in and out. And it works beautifully to give me the control that I want. Being able to get in and out of the scissors is very, very important. Now, my CBO, my Cosmo Barbarology scissors, I don't have rings on this one. I don't really need rings on this one, but you'll notice because of the twist, you see the kick or the twist in the thumb ring? That lets me set up right where I want to be. My thumb's coming right into the back of it to be able to control that. So this is, it's all about hand position. It's all about fitting. This is why scissors become very, very personal for a lot of hair cutters. A scissors that's really right for you and a really good fit. Jenna asked the question, what are my thoughts on swivel scissors? When we go to... Um, let me go there with you real quick. I just have a couple of scissors here left over from our scissor clinic conversation. Um, I didn't show these on camera the other day. This one is a radical offset swivel thumb scissors. I don't care for the scissors, but I point it out because it really sets you up. Look at my thumb. My thumb is all the way under my index finger. This is actually an American company. At one point, I was working with a company that was looking at buying this company, so they provided me with this scissor sample. Um, but it's got a radical offset and a swivel. Now, I personally don't care for swivels. Swivels, I think, take a little getting used to, and it's 50-50. Half the people out there swear by them and love them. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with swivels. And some people are just like, you know, I just can't do that. I'm a little more of a purist. I'm a little more traditional. I have a little more trouble. But look at this. Look how easy it is for me to keep the still blade still and the moving blade moving. The swivel, it doesn't put any pressure on my wrist. You know, from a manipulation standpoint, a lot of people love angles and positioning that you can cut. One of the big advantages of swivels for a lot of people is it lets you keep your elbow down. And there is a philosophy out there ergonomically that you want to avoid putting your elbow up any more than you have to. I typically cut with my elbow up a little more than some people, but I've always believed you're better off working on developing some nice, strong shoulders 
than you are focusing to keep your elbow down and not having that upper body strength. The upper body strength will serve you well your entire career. I do want to show you a cool scissors though. This was one that was given to me as a sample by my friends at Shark Fin. And this is kind of cool. It is a swivel. It's also what's referred to as a slider. Did you notice that movement? The thumb ring freely slides left and right and the thumb ring swivels. And you'll notice I do have the finger ring in there on that one just to provide me with the soft rubber on the inside that lets my thumb dig in there. But the cool thing about this is scissor over comb, notice the scissor, the swivel, is a whole lot further forward. When I go to cutting with my finger here, the swivel moved to a point further back along that slide. So this is called a slider swivel scissors. This is a specialty tool from Shark Fin. Kind of a cool tool. We're getting into a little bit of fun scissor clinic stuff here, but um, that one's a little special one. And again, if you love, if you love swivels, um, you may find those to be really beneficial. Um, while we're talking about scissors and ergonomics, I gotta show you this. This is called an X-Hand scissors, E-X-T-H-A-N-D. And I don't know if anybody's ever seen a scissor that looks quite like this. Have you guys ever seen one of these? This is a weird and funky scissors. And this was all about what they believe to be the ultimate in ergonomics for scissor use. I can tell you I found it to be a really cool scissors for overhead layering, an amazing scissors for point cutting, but a scissors that I generally did not like for perimeter cutting, whether we're cutting the bottom of a bob uh, or we're scissor over combing. I found it a little bit awkward for that, but look how this scissors works. This scissors you put in between two fingers, you wrap your finger around the bottom and then you actuate with your thumb. This one is the reverse of a scissors we would use in a traditional way. It's flip-flopped. It goes between and sits, and it has these funky ergonomic twisted kind of handles. And what I loved about it was for point cutting, this was really rather cool. For point cutting, I loved it. For scissor over comb, I thought it put my arm and my wrist at a bit of a weird angle. And for like bob cutting, for cutting underneath, didn't make sense for me at all. But you will find some hair cutters when you look around on the web that do some of those kinds of things. I worked with somebody that used to hold their scissors like this in their hand and they would cut like this and then they would point cut from above. The point cutting made sense just the same way this X hand kind of made sense. And these guys are on the web and these guys are all over the industry and kind of a cool scissors and had to have one just to understand how it really worked and what it was all about. But not particularly a practical tool, I thought, for the kind of volume haircutting that I do. Notice I qualify those statements by I thought for the haircutting that I do. That doesn't make it wrong, that just makes it different. All right. We talked about scissor parts, we talked about scissor care, we talked about scissor fitting. Now what I want to talk about is, we talked about our hand use. We talked about keeping the upper blade moving while the lower blade is still. We talked about having that action in our thumb, and we talked about um, Ninja Swordsman says, just curious, anyone. Uh, I don't know enough about the brand. I don't own a piece of that particular company's cutlery, so I personally can't offer up a thought on that. If there's anybody here on chat uh, that can answer Nicholas's question, go for it. Okay, let's cut some hair. Let's get into some technical cutting aspects of what we're doing here. Want to get her out, want to dampen her hair. We're scissor cutting, so we want to get a little bit of moisture or hydration in the hair. And as we've talked about in some other programming, when we get into scissor cutting, I think we have to talk about some basics. 
When we talk about basics, I'm talking about things like sectionings and partings. Sectioning and partings are the ways in which we break down a head of hair into smaller amounts than a whole head of hair. We don't cut the whole head at once. Now, there are times when I've gone through uh, demonstrations of what is called condensed cutting. Sometimes condensed cutting is also referred to as ganging sections. Ganging sections is where we gather together hair, or we condense hair from across the surface of the head to cut all at once. Um, there's a time and a place for condensed cutting. I'm making a note here. There's a time and a place for condensed cutting, and there's also a time and a place when condensed cutting may not be where we wish to go. So we're going to talk about sectioning. We're going to talk about dividing heads into sections. And when we get into a lot of technical haircut breakdowns, when we see people sharing a lot of information on how to cut a particular look or a particular style, let's adjust the camera. I'm more concerned you can see her. Don't worry about the top of my head. My top of my head doesn't need to really be in the program here. We're going to take partings to divide the head into sections. And we're gonna control individual sections of hair separately so that we can build out what we'll call components of a finished haircut shape or design. And I'll use clips to clip off sections, clipper grips. Uh, grippers are perfect for this. We'll use those grippers to section off portions of the head from portions that we're working on and portions that right now we want to ignore. And within those sections, we will take what we call subsections or partings. A parting is, for the best way to describe a parting is, it's less hair. A parting is a portion or a part of a section. And we're going to use differences in our tooth spacing or configuration to control some of this hair. You know, what I love about the Zoot Comb is that it's designed to work with all of our tools. We've talked about the big flat clipper comb for clipper over comb work, and we've talked about the little detail comb for a lot of our fine tuning and trimming work, but we've got the double teeth. We've got the wide teeth with the shallower teeth beneath it, the quarter height teeth. These are our tension teeth, so that when we are sectioning hair, we get into the throat, we get into the bottom of the comb, so that we get better distribution and tension within our section. Now, I want to talk about positioning, and I want to zoom in here a little bit so you can truly see this well. When we come in to cut, I caution people all the time that we don't want to cut in outer space. See where I am here, and in this case I can see that I slipped right out of the camera on zoom there. I'm going to go back to it. We're right here, we're right here, and we're here. I'm cutting here. Do you see the distance? There's a half an inch distance between my finger and my scissors. That is a no-no. That is what is going to result in you, at some point, taking the meat, the little squishy extra skin, you're going to take the meat right off your knuckles one day. You're going to cut that chunk right off the top of your fingers. Now, I've done it, you've done it, he's done it, she's done it, we've done it, but we don't want to do this. And I want to show you how to prevent this. This is going to be prevented by resting the scissor on your finger, by making contact with your finger when you cut. I want to spend a little bit of time on this because this is something some people struggle with. And once you figure this out, you gain an incredible amount of control. I am going to slide my fingers along the hair shaft to the point at which I wish to cut. In this case, I don't have a guide. This is my first section. This will create my guide. Your first section is your guide, then you follow your guide. But when we first set up our guide, I slide to my cutting point. My cutting point is right here flush with my fingers. My cutting point is not out here, up and off and away from my fingers. I am going to literally set the tip of my scissor on my finger. I'm going to set the tip of my scissor on my finger right there. My scissor will be touching my finger and then I'm going to walk it down my finger. Now, I want you guys to see something. I'm going to put my scissor right there, and you'll notice it's hard to see on camera, but on my finger right there, there is a white spot. There is a white bump. There's a little hard spot on my finger. That is a callus. A callus is the result of repeated pressure, repeated exposure, repeated contact 
on a point of your skin. You get a callus on your heel from your shoe rubbing and walking. I got a callus on my finger. The callus on my finger right there is from cutting hair. And the callus on my finger right there is because every single time I cut over the top of my fingers, I have touched my scissor to my finger. I have literally touched the tip of my scissor to my finger right there. And then I have done this. I've walked it across my finger in contact with my finger. I'm not cutting in outer space. I am firmly seated against my finger, resting on my finger. You see that? I am not out here up and off. I am on my finger, giving me very, very clean lines. Now, you all know the expression, don't cut past the second knuckle. Most of us heard, don't cut past the second knuckle. Most of us were told, don't cut past the second knuckle. And most of us were told that the first day of haircutting. And most of us don't listen. Most of us don't understand. And most of us don't know why. Can anybody tell me? You can either tell me in chat or you can tell me by unmuting your microphone. Does anybody want to tell me why is the rule don't cut past the second knuckle a rule? Haley got it right. Madison got it right. That's right, guys. I'm very happy to see that. You have no control. Forget about David. Forget about you'll cut yourself. Don't cut past the second knuckle was never about you're going to cut yourself. Don't cut past the second knuckle was about tension and control. You cut up to the second knuckle and you stop and you regrip and you get on your finger and you cut up to the second knuckle and you stop and you regrip and you cut again. You don't cut past the second knuckle. Here's why. When I hold my fingers up like this, you can see past the second knuckle right there, there's a gap. There's a space. If it was bright and shiny, you could see sunlight peeking through past the second knuckle. I can get my knuckles to touch and I can maintain contact of my fingers from the second knuckle to the tips. And by the way, look at my fingers, guys. Look at my finger. What do you notice about my fingers when I hold my fingers up there? Does anybody notice anything about my fingers when I hold my fingers up like that? I can stand here and talk to you all day long. My fingers are crazy dead straight. Look at my fingers. Look at my fingers. Look at my fingers. Do you know why my fingers are that straight? Why my fingers are that horizontal? Why my fingers are that even? They look like that because I've been doing this for 33 years years. It takes time. It takes discipline. Long time of cutting. That's right. Rock steady like that. If you're And I can't even do it. If your fingers bow up a little bit, you want to work on holding them straight. If your fingers are bent a little bit, you want to work on holding them straight. You want to know where straight is rock solid, dead straight. You're going to set this on here and you're going to walk it. Now, watch this, guys. Do you see my eyes? Do you see my eyes? Where are my eyes looking? Are my eyes looking at my fingers? I am opening and closing that scissors back and forth very, very, very quickly. And I am not even slightly concerned that I'm going to cut myself because I don't need to look. Because if my scissor is rested on my finger, it can't cut me. I can't get in there. I can't get in the blade. I'm stabilized. I'm rock steady. I'm precise. I'm in control. And past the second knuckle, I can maintain tension. Because watch what happens past the second knuckle. I can't maintain tension. So past the second knuckle, look what happens here. Do you see the hair? The hair buckles. I can't keep it tight right here. So what happens if I cut past the second knuckle? If I cut past the second knuckle, I'm not going to cut myself. I'm disciplined enough not to do it. But where this hair scoots down just a little bit, it's going to be a little bit longer because it's almost, in a sense, over-directed. It's going to be a little bit longer. Then when I hop over later to use it as a guide, my guide got longer, and my guide got longer, and my guide got longer. And little by little by little, I lose my line, and I lose control of the haircut, and I lose control of my precision, and I lose control of my shape. So it's going to be very important that you comb, and you hold, and you rest, and you cut to the second knuckle, regrip to the second knuckle, regrip to the second knuckle. And look, I don't even need to look at it. I can look at you while I'm cutting hair. Because once I got my grip, 
I know I can't cut me. That's what I call it haircutting hygiene. It's about working neat and clean, working precise and working in control. Resting that scissor right there. Now when I combine the moving blade and the non-moving blade, and I combine the stability of resting on my finger, now I've got some very precise control of the haircut that I'm trying to build. And I create a guide and I follow the guide and I don't lose and I don't cut the guide. Now I take my next parting, I've got a piece of my first section in my finger serving as my guide. I've got new hair living next door. I slide till I see the guide. I bring it right up to the base of my fingers. I cut two but not past the second knuckle and I move on up and I look at my guide and I cut two but not past the second knuckle and I continue out and through the process. That's the benefit of that level of control. And you'll notice I'm not opening my scissors a lot. I'm opening my scissors just a little. That's a six and a half inch scissor. A six and a half inch scissors got about three and a half inches of blade. There's about two and a half or three inches of handle, but I'm only cutting with about that much of the blade. I'm not opening the scissors more than that. I'm really working with, and a lot of times we joke around and say, you can have an eight inch scissors, but you're only cutting with the first inch. You're, how much of it are you really using? So I think that's important to be aware of. When we go to a much smaller scissors, this guy's a five and a half. I come in here with a five and a half, and I do like for what I call shape crafting, slightly smaller scissors like that. Um, I've got a great degree of control. Look at that line. The line is nice and the line is clean. We're only really cutting with the tips. Now, one of the things you'll see me do when I cut, and I can't do it with this mannequin because this mannequin is a mannequin. It's not a human and it doesn't have shoulders. I do what I call wiping the blade. Now you'll see hair is accumulated on the blade as I cut. Now normally I don't wipe it on me. Normally I wipe it on the client on the cape. Now if the client has a towel sitting on top or if it's just my regular cloth cape, you know, sanitation. These are all the reasons why this stuff is important. I will cut and let's take a new section. I'm going to part away some of what we've already worked with. I'll grip that away. I'll take a new section and I'm just matching it to the existing guide. Get a nice clean parting there. Comb it up. Hold it up. Look for our guide. If you can't see the guide, don't cut. And cut it off. Comb it up. Hold it up and cut it off. Now as hair accumulates on the blade, it's harder for me to see the blade, it's harder for me to see the guide, it's harder for me to maintain control, I will wipe the blade. I'll do it on the back of the cape like that. And you see that just wiped off on my arm. Generally I wouldn't wipe it on my arm, I don't have a cape and I wanted to make the point, but all that hair came off of the blade in that way. I'd be very careful because some of the edges of those blades can be razor, razor sharp and on your arm at some point you're going to cut yourself and you don't want to do that. But I just wanted to demonstrate that that's coming off in that way. One of the last things I want to talk about in the context of real scissor cutting basics, section and subsection, comb up your sections, tension, distribution, elevation, and control, cutting with the tips of your scissors, resting your scissors on your finger, keeping the moving blade moving and the still blade still, not quacking like a duck. You don't want to quack like a duck for that precision control. I do want to talk about cutting with product in the hair. Now this mannequin was left over from some cutting we did the other day, our curve comb cutting, and I had put in some Clipper Guy wax. She hasn't been shampooed, so this wax is still in the hair. I believe that this wax is a good example of a lightweight styling product that can be a superb agent as a cutting product in the hair. Uh, some leave-in conditioners, some spray-on conditioners, sometimes a little light styling mousse, a light styling gel, or in this case a water-based, water-soluble uh, wax type product is really perfect for improving our clean sectioning and parting. It maintains hydration. Throughout a haircut, hair tends to dry down. I'm working over here, maybe I'm water spraying it a little bit. Meanwhile, over here the hair's drying down. When I get to the other side, if there are variations in moisture, variations in hydration from one side of the haircut to the other, those variations in hydration will lead to differences in tension differences in elasticity and differences in distribution and control. And that's another area or another element of where a haircut can get off because 
Wet hair stretches more than dry. Fine hair stretches more than coarse. So if you have fine hair that's wet, it's going to have a lot of elasticity. If you have fine hair on the other side of the exact same head that's not so wet, it won't stretch as much. So when you apply tension to it, you will be cutting at a very different point or a different length. And again, an example of where haircuts can kind of wander off your plan or off your path. So having product in the hair helps maintain even and consistent moisture, which maintains even and consistent tension, elasticity, distribution, and control. So it's a strong argument for product in the hair. Uh, whatever product works for you, whatever product you find beneficial for your cutting in that way. All right, with about 10 minutes left, a little less, maybe nine, questions. This was an attempt on my part to focus on some very sort of first level scissor cutting basics. Some of the things you're going to want to know uh, in, in basic scissor cutting. Holding fake hair in your fingers and working with sections in that way, working with scissors. Questions? Anybody got anything? What do you got for us this morning? Who's out there? Who's involved? Who's engaged? Who's thinking early in the morning? Anybody? We use this little bit of time near the tail end for Q&A, and we're going to get ready to come back for our 11 o'clock class. What is our 11 o'clock class? Does anybody know? Can anybody tell me what's 11 o'clock today? Nobody? Somebody remembers what's on at 11. We'll see you over in Facebook land. Haley. Running on time, time management, Edna, time management, yeah. We're going to talk about running on time and extraordinarily important. And do you think the 11 o'clock class is going to start on time? Anybody got a guess? The class on how to run on time, will that class start on time? There's a pretty good chance it will. That is correct. I love these webinars. Uh, who made the first swivel you showed us? I believe uh, both of the swivels that I showed you guys, uh, oh, that first one. You know, I, it doesn't have a name on it. Let me see if I have it here. I think these guys went out of business. It's a company, it says Razor Cuts, R-A-Z-O-R-C-U-T-Z, Razor Cuts. Um, and it says made in USA. I do remember from my conversations with these guys at the time, uh, this was a company based in Georgia, maybe outside of Atlanta, but based in Georgia. Uh, it was a domestic scissor company, which at the time was kind of odd. Uh, it's got a bit of a weird finish to it. You've got some polished stainless for the blade, and I don't know what the material is. And then you have um, polished stainless for the blade, and then you have uh, a brushed, uh, almost aluminized, uh, not nickel, but a, but a brushed finish for the handles themselves. They've got some nice texture, and I think for folks that like swivels, uh, it's potentially a really cool scissors. Um, but like I said, never heard much from these guys, never seen them at a show, and they went away. If you're early, you're okay. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, you're late. Yeah, if you're... <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about that, David. Absolutely. Uh, and somebody had commented earlier, I think it was just a compliment, but hey, if it's a compliment, I'll take it. Uh, and I can't wait to get to try to cut. Absolutely, Nicholas. This This is not a substitute for your classes at school and it's not a substitute for real cutting on clients. It's designed to be uh, valuable information that you can have and you can use, um, but it's not going to go away. You know, little by little states are opening up. When we get back to school in a formal way, um, I'm still going to be doing these. We're working out what will be a long-term plan for ongoing education in this way. Uh, our industry that really needs to be hands-on, there's no question about it. All right, guys, any other questions before we knock off for now that'll give me a chance to uh, regroup and get back here at 11 o'clock for running on time? And I will be on time to run on time for the run on time conversation. Anybody else? Speak now. Don't be late. I won't. Thanks, guys. Have a great morning. Nine o'clock's a wrap, and we'll see you at 11.